Well, good evening. We have so much that we've already considered this evening to be thankful for. Our instruction this evening was to consider the separation that God's holiness and our sinfulness creates, demands, uh, is truly a measure of who we are. And I think that through the scripture already this evening, we've had such a clear picture and understanding of that. As we come to our time of, of communion uh, this month, we're commanded to partake in order to remember uh, that there is not just a, a ceremony that we're participating in. It's not just a, a unique gathering once a month that's, that's different. Uh, certainly those are true about it, but the purpose, the reason for it is that we would partake of communion as the body of Christ and that we would do so in remembrance. And, and the question, we always put this before, and I know you've heard it before, but I think it's, it's, it's a good reminder as we're called to remember, what is it that we're remembering? What are we commanded to remember? And, and oftentimes people will say, well, well, Jesus, yes, but specifically one singular component of the life of Christ, one thing about Jesus, and that thing is his body broken and his blood shed. Or to put it simply, it was, is the cross of Jesus Christ. His, his crucifixion is what we are called at communion to pause and, and, and meditate, to think upon. And so every time that we partake of communion, our desire is to try and focus on some aspect of the crucifixion uh, in our message in order to both teach us and, and remind us about that. This evening, I want to look at a part of the crucifixion, uh, the scene that, that, that is contained in the Gospels. And, and this particular aspect, it, it makes little waves often. Uh, it's not something that necessarily rises to the forefront. It's not unfamiliar. We've actually heard it spoken of already this evening. But it's something that it depicts a massively significant truth. And, and that truth is, is the removal of the barrier that our sin and God's holiness created. What, what Ransom was reading from, from Job's lament in the midst of his suffering, I wonder at times, do we think that way? And my question is, would you will that God would bring us as low as Job so that we might think that way? And the answer ought to be from each of us resoundingly, no, Lord, no. Let it not take that. But what Job was recognizing and what he was lamenting about in chapter 9 is that in his life, he recognizes that there's a separation between him and God. And God does as he pleases. God is sovereign. God is ruling. God is governing. God is loving. And we can believe at times, no matter what we're facing, that God is good and only does good. But that does not alleviate the pain of the suffering in the moment. And it's because we were not created for that suffering. It's what makes heaven beautiful is that there's this, this recognition that we are going to arrive someday at a place where guilt and shame and suffering and death and all the effects that sin through the separation from our God has, has wrought upon us will cease. They shall be no more. And so as we suffer, we long for that to end, to be remedied, to be fixed, to be corrected. And, and it's interesting because that's what we're called to look at. That's what was accomplished at the cross. Jesus came to bridge the gap of one who is holy, God, and one who is not, me, and to bridge that gap in such a way Job describes it so beautifully. He says there's none who can lay his hand upon both. There's none who can bridge from, from God's holiness to my sinfulness as a man. There's none who can do that. No, not one. There's none. And yet there's one been promised. And, and there was misunderstandings, massive misunderstandings from, from Genesis 3 forward about what it meant that there would be one who would crush the head of the serpent, the one who had deceived and brought this to bear. There was massive misunderstanding on what it meant that they would come forth from the root of David, from the root of Jesse, one who would rule eternally with justice and perfection. Hey, there was massive confusion throughout all of this time. And so Job, being aware at the very least of the promises made to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, still did not have a clear picture of, well, how is that going to happen? And so all he knew is that there's none who can bridge the gap between God and man and right now, in the midst of suffering, I am utterly aware of it. 
And at the cross, when Christ gave us his righteousness and bore our punishment, he bridged that gap. He broke down that separation. There's therefore no separation because he is the bridge between it. Here's just a few places I'm going to read from, from a few gospel accounts specific to this. In Matthew 27, verses 50 and 51, it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. In Mark's gospel, chapter 15, verses 37 to 38, it says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And it's interesting because it tells us this, from top to bottom. Same thing Matthew said. And it's interesting that the gospel writers make a note of, of where the tear started. In Luke 23, 44 to 46, Luke records this. It was now about the sixth, sixth hour. <clears throat> and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. And so we recognize in those gospel accounts there is a, there, there is a, a coordination between the death of Christ, the yielding up of his spirit, and the tearing of the temple. The veil, the, the tearing of the veil. And so in three out of the four gospel, we see this account being torn in two, corresponding with the death of Jesus, the very thing that he himself commanded us at the Last Supper to be, uh, to, to remember about him when we gather for the Lord's table. It was a significant event, and I'm afraid that it loses its richness to our Gentile ears. It loses its richness. When we read, for example, what Job said, and we read the account of how the law was given to, to build this in, we, we often miss that. It's our study of Hebrews, and, and in that study, it was amazing how much it forced my Gentile mind to be reminded of so much that, that is true from Scripture that I'd never fully connected dots. A very simple example is the priesthood. As a Christian, I think in terms of the priesthood, I think in terms of modern priesthood, Catholicism, and it's bad right? It's not biblical. It's, it's in error and wrong, and so I want nothing to do with it. Or I think in terms of Old Covenant Judaism priesthood, and it's been made obsolete. It's not necessary, so what measure do I have of it? But I love, through our study of the book of Hebrews, to be reminded, to be, to be taught, really, what it means. What was the role of the priest? And therefore, if Christ has made that obsolete by fulfilling it, and even yet still is fulfilling it, then it gives me a much clearer picture of the very one whose praises I sing. That Christ made the mediation, that he is my high priest, even now interceding. That his death intercedes into the future, and that he even now is interceding. So learning those things is significant. Now again, in the same way that worship in the temple, the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the veil, the details of how the, the curtain was hung and what the curtain's purpose was, is lost oftentimes on our modern Gentile ears. I think everyone here is probably aware the veil was torn in two. Even having just read it prior to hearing it tonight reminded, it wasn't a shock to you to learn that the veil in the temple was torn in two at the death of Christ. But the significance of it. Well, what was the curtain or the veil? Well, it was a barrier or wall over the entrance of the Holy of Holies where God's glory was said to dwell in certain seasons before the people. Now, in this, by God's provision, there was only one man in the whole nation. And the entire nation of Israel, God's people, there was only one man who could ever enter the Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest. And that man could only enter the Holy of Holies on one single day of the year, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. On that day, and that day alone, he could enter into the Holy of Holies to fulfill the duties that the high priest carried. He had to wear special garments for that day, garments that were worn no other day of the year, especially were set aside for that. He must bring with him the blood of a goat to sprinkle upon his entrance. 
He himself must have cleansed himself through multiple sacrifices in order to enter in prior to going in to offer the final sacrifice on behalf of the people. He must sprinkle the blood on the golden mercy seat that was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Now think about this. If anyone other than the high priest ever entered the Holy of Holies, he was dead in that moment. He died. Instantly, he was struck down. If the high priest himself, who could enter it on Yom Kippur, entered on any other day than the Day of Atonement, he was dead. He was struck down in that moment. If the high priest came without the blood of a goat to offer, he was struck down to the degree that you may have heard some of the things recorded about it. There are recordings of, of high priests who at times in preparation for it had sacrificed one high priest that's recorded sacrificed nine bulls just to make sure that he'd covered his own sin completely before he entered in. He knew that if he entered in and had not fulfilled what was necessary, and so he kept sacrificing bulls just to make sure. You've heard the accounts that they would put a bell sometimes upon the, the, the robe of the high priest so because no one could go in there and get him. And no one, and if they heard the bell stop moving, it meant that he had gone in in some way unworthy and he had been struck down. And they would pull him out by a rope that was attached to him. This is lost on our We think of, a, 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 well, there was a curtain. No, it was a barrier. And it was a barrier that represented the separation of man's sinfulness from God's holiness. It, it represented that so clearly. Everything about the system, if you ever go back and examine it, and I would encourage you to do that regularly, everything about the law, the sacrificial system, everything about the priesthood, everything that's given in Leviticus, you know those, those books that people are like, I don't, I don't know if I ever really read Leviticus or understood it. Let me give you a basic brief understanding. It all is pointing to the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. It is a continual, absolute reminder. God is holy, man is not, and therefore there is separation. That's what it's about. And it was here that the curtain described in the Gospels was hung to maintain that separation. In other words, it had a pivotal, important role that's beyond anything that we think of often when we think of a curtain. When we think of a curtain, we probably imagine something like your living room drapes. The curtain in the temple was nothing like that. And in Exodus 26, it described as a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, finely twisted linen with cherubim worked into it by a skilled craftsman. We just heard that read already. It's recorded that it was 60 feet long. I don't know if we knew that. 20 feet wide, woven to the thickness of a man's hand, and it required some 300 men to lift it in place. This is not a curtain or a veil in the way that we might think of it. Only God could tear apart a curtain like that. And it wasn't without purpose. In so doing, he was symbolizing that the death of Christ had accomplished access unto him in his holiness. It did not diminish his holiness. God did not veil his holiness in such a way that now he can come out amongst us. No. He brought the holiness of his son, the righteousness of his son, and, and poured it out upon us so that we could now come into his presence. I want to reflect on three, three truths that the torn curtain means for us from the book of Hebrews. We'll begin in Hebrews chapter 10. And the first thing is that Christ accomplished on our behalf is in order that we might come with assurance. With assurance. We're, we're not even like the high priest. There was one who was allowed to come in the presence of God one day a year. But even he did not come with assurance. As I said before, the accounts of what the high priest had to do for himself and, and, and the fear that accompanied that one day a year duty of coming into the presence of the Almighty. It was not something that was considered awesome or wonderful. Like I think at times we're tempted to think, man, what a cool thing. I really wish that, that I could have that role back then and go in and see the Shekinah glory of the Lord. That would have been amazing. No, 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 no. Wrong view. That's not the view that was held by the people of Israel. Remember when God appeared on the mountain to Moses. And, and even then they just had a glimpse. They could hear what Moses was there. And God said, there's no other one like Moses ever in the world. 
who's able to come before me in a face-to-face fashion. No one else can do that. And the people said, no, no, we know. And they begged Moses. What did they beg of him? Lord, please, you, you deal with him. We can't handle it. We can't bear for the glory of God to be near us. Isaiah, as we heard earlier from chapter 6, recognized it. When, when, when the old covenant people, children of God, considered coming into his presence, there was no assurance. There was fear and there was trembling and there was the opposite of assurance. There was, let me make sure the one man in the entire nation that was able to go one time a year, let me please make sure that I do everything in accordance with the law to the greatest degree because the only assurance I have is that if I mess this up, I die. That was the assurance that was given But listen to to the author of Hebrews in chapter 10, 19 and following. It says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Before Jesus, there was obedience, but it was not in assurance. It it was in faith, yes, but even in the act of obedience, it was through timidity and fear. It was through many things other than, and here the author of Hebrews just wrote to the Hebrew people and said, don't you understand the superiority of Christ? What it means that he's made the old covenant obsolete, that he's become the high priest and that in his flesh he has done away with the veil and bridged the gap, giving us access. He's allowed, you can come near now. You can come near with a sincere heart and full assurance. We have assurance to enter into his presence because Christ inaugurated, initiated or started this new and living way. And he did so through his flesh being broken. He didn't just take on flesh. He took on flesh to have that flesh die. He took on flesh to have it broken. So also was the barrier the curtain represented broken. When we think of his body broken, we ought to think about the curtain and it's being torn in two. The high priest had to enter and then exit every year with the curtain remaining. Jesus entered and tore it in half, and it is no more. To the Jew who took the old covenant seriously, that had been their way of life, that structured everything about their life, can you imagine the awesome implications that they would have understood and the the veil, the barrier between the holy of holies that the high priest alone entered one day a year with much preparation, that suddenly they're being told that through Jesus they now have access Can you imagine the, I don't have a category to even tell us how to think on that. Imagine with all of our, all of our concerns and desires and other things for government, if suddenly it was said, hey, if you want to go talk to the president about it, you just go up and knock on the door and you can walk right in and talk to him and actually you have that access, right? That, that's not even comparable. It's not even comparable. And yet at the same time, we have some measure of thinking, yeah, that wouldn't go so well right now. If I walked up to the, to the White House and tried to walk in to see the president, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't get to see the president. I, I'm not positive of that, but I'm fairly certain. In so many greater ways, what they had received was, was bigger and larger than that and what we too have received. And I don't want our modern ears to lose that implication, that, that beauty and grace. The age-old question of how can a man be right with God has been answered in a permanent, not an annual needs to be done again next year fashion, in a permanent fashion it's been answered. No more daily, no more monthly, no more yearly atonement. We need to hear that. We're we're prone to forget this truth in our Christian life and want to start making atonement. We want to start bargaining and trading and, and start trying to, like Job's friends, understand, well, this hasn't gone the way I wanted. What have I not done? What do I need to do? Why is this lacking? How do I step up my game? How do I correct myself? How do... That is not the biblical view of the gospel. 
That's not what we celebrate and remember. We now have access to him directly. No more going to a mediator for the relationship with God that individually we each have. At communion, we celebrate what Christ has accomplished. The sad truth is that many of our lives are marked by complacence and not, not assurance. Not assurance to, to, to come into his presence. As, as we go about our daily lives, oftentimes we do so as though he's given us nothing. God, I've got to carry this weight. What a trial I'm in. I don't know what to do, but I'm going to figure it out. Let us even this night be reminded that it was God who called us unto himself. He sent his son. We could not demand that from him. We could not exhort that from him. He did that. And he called us unto himself. In love he spared not only, not his own son, so that we might have eternal life and assurance in the life that we now live until that eternal life. The second mark of our new access unto God through the flesh of Christ torn on our behalf was that we should come confidently. We heard it her in chapter 10, but also in Hebrews chapter 4, it says the same thing, verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, or because of Jesus, our high priest, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Now, this is not the normal posture of one who would enter into the presence of a king. If you're familiar with the account of Esther, when, when she was told by her, her cousin, you have to go before the king and speak. The Lord's placed you in this position. She goes, you don't understand. He hasn't asked for me. If anyone comes into the presence of the king without being requested, they risk their head being cut off. Right? The, the normal posture of coming before a king is not one with confidence. And this is the king of kings. This is the holy of holies, the sovereign of sovereigns. And the author of Hebrews says, no, no. Because of Jesus and what he accomplished in his flesh at the cross, well, let us draw near with confidence to the throne that's before us. In the same way for we who are sinners to come with confidence into the presence of the Almighty. Does that, does that pause you to give you, give you reason to pause in your daily lives and what we're doing. I know things are a mess. Life is hard. Schedules are crazy. Inflation is off the chain. Families are in struggle. The youth of our nation are losing their minds. Everyone's turning on everyone. Nobody gets along anymore. Everything's just a mess. But really, Jesus died so that you can have eternal life with him. Whatever it is and however bad it is, it just ain't that bad. It just isn't. Now, it can be if we take our eyes off of Christ. It's one of the things which Christ has given us in the gift of communion that in remembrance we would be reminded in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of struggle, in the midst of sin, in the midst of all that is truly tr true about our existence, that this also is equally true and even greater truth in what it provides for us. When God looked at him, he saw us upon that cross. Right? That, that he looked at Jesus and saw me. So that because he did that, when he now looks at me, he sees Jesus. That's the mediation. That's the priesthood. That's the tearing, the access that was given. I love this account. I've shared it before, but I want to share it again. James Stewart, a minister in Scotland, often told a tale of an old Scottish believer who went to church one day feeling down because of his sins. I just want to say, I think that's a wonderful posture to be in. But praise God, he doesn't leave us in that. I was just sharing with someone day, today, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But praise God, he doesn't call us to live in that fear forever. The, the terror fear the, the recognition that the beginning of knowledge is, is the fear of the Lord or the recognition that he is my judge. He is holy and I am not and therefore I'm in big trouble. That's the beginning. But then comes justification. Then comes adoption. Then comes access. Then comes relationship. Then comes sanctification. Then comes glorification. Right? We don't get left in that. We do have to start there. 
No one who has known the terror of the Lord will cry, who has not known the terror of the Lord would ever cry out, Lord, save me from what? Save me from hypothetical things that might someday happen? That will not produce faith. Save me because I know. And, and, and so this man came feeling down, and where did he come? He came to church in the midst of it. And when the communion plate was pla- passed, he refused to partake of the elements, thinking himself unworthy. Now we have a wrong posture, a, a wrong view. And as he was doing this, he glanced up and saw a young woman in the congregation who also refused to partake. partake, And then she broke into tears. And Stuart, the pastor, he, he tells us what happened next. Her tears jarred this man back to the truth of the gospel that he himself needed to recall. And in a whisper that could be heard across the church, he was heard to say, Take it, lassie. Take it. It is meant for sinners. And he himself partook. And this points us to our final consideration for this evening from Hebrews. The other thing that we are given through the sacrifice of Christ is hope. Hope. Hebrews 6, 19 to 20 describes it in this way. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul. A hope both sure and steadfast. And one which enters within the veil. It, it doesn't leave us out to sea. It brings us all the way home. This hope does not leave us stuck in our sin. It brings us inside the veil. It tears the veil. Where Jesus himself has entered as a forerunner for us. On our behalf, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Part of what we are to do in communion is to examine ourselves. To find the sin which so easily entangles us and hinders our race. To cast it off. To examine ourselves. And the truth is, as we examine ourselves, we will find shortfalls. Any person who thinks, I've gone this day without sinning, is someone who needs to reconsider their understanding of what sin is and what God is and his holiness and those things. We will find those things. But it's not meant to leave us low and stuck in them. As that Scottish man said to that young lady. No, that's why he did this. That's why he's, a, he's finished this. We are to examine ourselves. And when we do, we will find them. But we don't stay in them. You see, if we meditate on our own unworthiness and inability for too long. We will be without hope. There is no hope in us. If we focus on us for too long, you will be left hopeless. But if you will look to yourself in examination and then look to Christ and the finished work which he accomplished, there is hope that is entered within the veil as a forerunner that we might follow where he has gone. Praise be unto him that our hope is not on ourselves. But it is in the finished work of Christ who made a perfect sacrifice once for all, anchoring us eternally to our Heavenly Father. Think of the words that we just sang two songs ago. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. There will be times when the second verse is very real to us, when darkness veils his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale. My anchor holds within the veil. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. This is the ultimate meaning of the curtain torn in two. It was not a simple act that, that had no meaning, that God just in the midst of everything else said, oh, break some rocks and tear that curtain. People will know that I was here. I left my mark. No, it had absolutely eternal implications. That we have hope. That we who were eternally unworthy in ourselves, now in him have been made eternally worthy. 
Tonight, as we partake of communion, let us do so in remembrance of our high priest sacrifice and offer him praise and honor with our lives in all things. Would you pray with me as we prepare for that? Lord, we are thankful for your grace and provision. It is boggling to us, and Lord, we get so busy and so distant from your word that we don't consider what it means that you gave the priesthood, the Levitical code, and the things that they had to carry out. That we don't consider what it means that, that you are holy and that there is separation because of our sin. We, we get caught up in a culture and environment that tells us we're basically good and just try harder and say you're sorry and do your best. But Lord, those are all insufficient. None of those are, are, are sufficient to the task before us that you've placed within us. But Lord, you are sufficient. And if we will but stand upon you, you are the rock in the midst of sinking sand. We will weather the storms. We will endure with patience. We will make it to the end and receive the fullness of our salvation. We shall see you someday with unveiled face and behold your glory and receive the glory that is ours as your sons and daughters. Lord, these are the truths of who we are. And they proclaim your worthiness in every page, in every letter, in every word. Would we be reminded this evening as we partake of this what it means that you died for our sins. Thank you. Thank you. And Lord, we ask your blessings upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen.